let me be very direct. Isn't hope an opium for the Palestinian people? I, we, we have seen o uh, President Obama speaking about hope, and then a few years later, that f fired back, maybe. I'm, I'm a musician. I work with musicians in Palestine, and they told me, like, in the 90s, they, they uh, made music with Israelis and singing in Hebrew and Arabic and then uh, together uh, in English. But now they stop because they say we don't want any more creating the symbols of, 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 of living normalization. together. Normalization, yeah. Like normalization, yes. So what about hope? And quite frankly, uh, while conceding the point at the philosophical level, I cannot accept it at the practical level. I guess my short answer is, and this is something I thought about before, I mean, these are not really words I use, that's my state of mind. You have absolutely no choice if you're a Palestinian other but to be optimistic. There is no choice. Now, this is a matter of conscious decision-making. It's not, you know, optimism to me is not a state of mind. It's an act of conscious determination and decision-making. You can choose to be optimistic. You can choose to be pessimistic. In my view, you have to choose to be optimistic. It's a, it's a matter of choice. I can defend it only in those terms, but I cannot really justify it on any other ground superior to the content of, of, of your own comment. But to really think about it, you know, what this is about is, is about building a nation. This is about building a state. This is about ending occupation. This is about getting our people to enjoy that which is an absolute right for all peoples around the world, live as free people with dignity in a country of our own. This is not small. Now, I submit respectfully to you that you cannot get there if you are down. You have to lift your spirit up. You have to think it's possible. There is no way that the possible you know, will happen or the impossible will begin to look less certain than it, it, it does look generally unless you are in that high state of spirit, spirit of, uh, state of, of high spirit. So you really have to first inspire yourself. And if you are in government, obviously, it's a key responsibility of yours to inspire people around you. And if you really fail to do so, that's a major failure because this is about doing something that's really big. So yeah, from time to time, people, you know, feel down. I mean, there's a lot in the Palestinian context to complain about. There's a lot to complain about if you're Palestinian. There's a lot to even cry about if you're Palestinian. And I do that, but I do not, I choose not to stop there. You know what I'm saying? You have to really go beyond. You have to go beyond. You have to really change this reality by defying it. You have to reject status quo by doing something about it and not just complaining about it. Build, you know, project the reality of, the, of statehood on the ground. That process itself is rejuvenating. It, it, it really builds character and it really reinforces a sense of possibility uh, in ways that I think can be extremely transformative. We read the Million Dialogue and what first struck me was its relevance today. Um, ah. And let me give, me a, a, give you an example. Uh, when I was in Amman recently, I spoke to this Syrian human rights lawyer, and she told me uh, what's happening in Damascus at this moment, um, where the regime has besieged parts of the city uh, belonging to the opposition and belonging to those people demanding freedom and democracy and justice. Um, and due to this siege, nothing can enter these areas of the, of the city. So no goods, no food. And as a result, the people face starvation. Um, so the regime has given them a choice and has portrayed it on these huge banners hanging throughout the city saying, hunger or on your knees. Um, so I was struck by the similarities of the situation of the million people and I wonder today, two and a half thousand years later, um, when idealism and realism clash, who wins? Realism in the short run, idealism in the long run. How about that? Uh, uh, I, 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 and I think those in power should really keep that in mind. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, going back to 
the rubs, uh, rubs point. Uh, democracy, uh, people are not going to be there forever uh, in government. That's a, a good thing. The downside to this uh, is that they tend to think in terms of quick gratification. I mean, you, you're not going to really find it easy to look at the political cycle where those who are in power are not interested in making a difference and to make it quickly. Now, this in itself is a good thing, but when it comes to international relations, it, it, it's a lot more challenging. I mean, it's, you know, in order to satisfy as many people as you possibly can, uh, I, I think it's really good to get into the job with a sense of, with some sense of urgency, that you really want to make a difference. You, you really are not going to take forever to think about things. You have already thought them through before you ran for office. After all, you had good idea as to what to do with the taxation regime, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, there's nothing wrong with trying to really go for uh, a quick solution as, as quickly as you possibly can, uh, but of course not at the expense of long-term prospects of uh, sustainability. What I do not understand is, you know, why politicians, uh, not personal to you, okay. in the Fatah party, they always talk about we need to keep hope, we need to keep dream. You, you always go to the United Nations, you ask, please give us our country, please recognize us. And you say, you gotta dress like you, you don't walk with, the, you don't, don't go with the wave, you gotta be yourself. And then I ask myself, why you don't take your freedom? Just say for we've been oppressed for more than 65 years. You seek for democracy, but here in Holland, democracy didn't come. They, start, they don't start with democracy. Democracy come after the rebellion, you know? And you talk about Libya, you talk about South Africa. They already were states. Then they're gonna look for their freedom. Yeah. And I do not understand how you can look for democracy before you got a state. It's a choice as to the instruments that you choose to deploy in your struggle for justice. That's the determination that people make. Now, to my way of thinking, I said, for example, attainment of our national rights is something that we should continue to pursue on the strength of stubborn nonviolence. That's the doctrine that I stand on. And I think it's superior, and I think in a practical sense, definitely, uh, one can really engage in debate on this, uh, but you know, my own view is that you will, you will find uh, that it has really served our cause a lot better, although I'm for it, again, on grounds of principle. That's the choice that, that you make. There's nothing wrong with appealing to what international law says. I mean, international law, after all, is that you know, codified, you know, set of rules that the world has agreed on in terms of what is permissible, precisely to put brakes on what you know, the powerful and the mighty would otherwise do all by themselves. Is it a perfect system? I was asked a question, did not respond to this before. I mean, it's been there for many, many decades, and I think it's really time to really take another look at it, to really see the extent to which it is adequate for world affairs to continue to be governed uh, this autocratically, if you will, where, you know, one country or a select group of countries, because of who they are, you know, can shape outcomes so unilaterally without taking into account, you know, what the rest of the world thinks, this, the overall sentiment, the sense, the sense of the consensus of humanity when it comes to the justness or unjustness, what goes on, uh, 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 whether in our part of the world uh, or elsewhere. So, you know, I, I think... That's really a choice that countries make, people, people make. I'm not really here to really say uh, that I should really force this on others. All I'm, all I'm saying with modesty is that this is something that I believe is a lot more reasonable. But as I said, I agree with you on something fundamental. You do not just park it there. You don't go to New York or to The Hague or places and, and, and seek justice under international law and complain about things without without beginning with what you need, you need to do consistent with your own national objectives. Our freedom is not really going to be given to us. It's going to be earned by us. It's up to us to win that freedom. And I think we can win it on the strength of what we do every day. And I believe 
We are closer to that goal. Every day we succeed in keeping one Palestinian family on the ground where it is. Every day we succeed in securing access by one Palestinian child to a school or someone who is sick in need of health care, access to health care facility or safe drinking water. Isn't this about perseverance? Isn't this about withstanding the adversity under occupation? Is it, about, is it not the highest responsibility facing any responsible government in Palestine to ensure the capacity of our people to persevere and withstand the adversity of occupation? The answer is yes to all of these questions. And I think that's a very important part of resistance, if you will. To resist in this sense is to exist. You can't expect people to withstand this adversity on the strength of speeches or appealing to some ideals in the abstract. You have to provide the means, the wherewithal that would make that steadfastness possible in the form of what we do every day to take a step closer and another one toward our goal of freedom with dignity. I thank you, Mr. Raymond, for this opportunity. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks.